weight gain and, oh, well, you know, I don't fit into my genes anymore. Um, people really um, very quickly give up on themselves instead of working towards optimal and potential, as I was talking about. And I think sex changes in the same way our bodies do, or like they're intricately bound, over time. So nobody at 50 is going to have the sex life they had at 30. But does that mean you give up on sex, or do you start to get curious about, well, what does turn me on right now, and what do I like, and what would be fun and arousing to me, and then do I dare sit down with my partner and talk to him and her about it after we've been married for 25 years or so. Yeah. And they're like, whoa, well, you didn't do that when we were first married. And it's like, yeah, well, we were 20 when we were first married. And yeah. I didn't even think about that then. And I didn't need that then. Fascinating. You know, <clears throat> when you're 20, somebody walks by and you're aroused. That's foreplay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding, yeah. Right? When you're 30 and you have kids, that changes a little bit. You know, 40s, 50s, 60s are really when we have the best sex of our lives because we're much more uh, we're less inhibited, uh, we're less hung up about things, we don't really care about the things that used to bother us, like how does my hair look or my thighs. Um, we're much more interested in connection with ourselves and the other. But if we're not bringing it to our partner, we can't expect that our partner, you know, I, I hear this all the time too, well, you know, he or she just doesn't turn me on anymore. And it's like, well, is that their fault or your fault? Ah, yeah. Like, who's doing is that? Is that because they're no longer a sexual being? Now, maybe they're not. Maybe they've gained 100 pounds and you're not into... Um, people that are overweight, because there are a whole bunch of people who are into that. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's not your thing, then you've got another difficult conversation to have with your partner, which is we now have a problem. Yeah. This is my problem, not yours. You've chosen to gain that 100 pounds. It's not arousing to me, so we're going to have to do something about this relationship. That's fascinating. How often does that type of thing happen? Not necessarily weight gain, but somebody changes so drastically and either they're uh, passions or their psychology or their, their physical appearance, and then it impacts the, the relationship to a level that must be addressed. Um, it happens a lot, and it's surprising how many people are willing to live in sexless marriages versus um, saying, I, um, you know, this is important to me because I don't feel like a full, vital person as a result of it. Um, and so I want to be with a partner who's loving or caring or who's sexually interested in me, um, which means leaving the marriage. Now, part of what's happening today, too, is people are thinking about opening their marriages up more than they've ever thought about it before. Certainly in the younger cohort, people in their you know, early 40s, 30s, 20s, um, less so people in their 50s and 60s, because by then they've got you know, major household businesses, kids, grandkids sometimes. Um, but the problem is when, it, when voice is not given to that problem, then somebody inevitably cheats or they just turn to, you know, pornography. And that can feel like cheating to the partner. So the call here, the demand to, for all of us to grow and change over a lifetime is to challenge ourselves when it comes to sex sexuality and say, wow, you know, Jake, when you tell me you want to have sex in a alien costume, <laughs> that really breaks me out. Today's but, the day they're taking over Area 51, I think, by the way. <laughs> I, th I think they're taking over Area 51. There's this group oh, right, that went, yeah, I think that is today, um, as it turns out. Okay, and if I'm your partner, that may be really unusual and weird to me, but if it doesn't really take me out of my integrity... And I could say, okay, I'm curious about why that alien costume is arousing to you. I want to know more about it. And if I can manage my anxiety to get curious enough about you and I'm willing to try it, I may actually end up liking it. And then what does it say about me that I like alien costumes during sex? Because right. it's typically our own judgment about the sexual act that's problematic. It's not the sexual act itself. It's Correct. our judgment of it because what does it say about me? What would my mother think if she knew I was doing this? Yeah, tell, keep going. Tell more about that because there's a, there's a whole rich uh, mind to be dug in that area. Well, sure. What would my church say? What would my friends say? So 
you know, you can take a sexual act and ask 10 different people what they think about it, just oral sex, for example, and one person will say it's disgusting, and one person will say it's heavenly. So which is it? It's whichever you want, right? That's the right answer, I hope. The meaning that you ascribe to it, it's the judgment in your head about it. And then to roll your eyes and say to your partner, well, you're disgusting because you like oral sex, is really um, a very form invalidating. of, um, I mean, it's very judgmental and it's very moralistic as opposed to, it makes me squeamish and I want to find out why it makes me squeamish. Instead, you're a pervert, so I'm not doing it. So when you're investigating the whys to the what, to the, to the reaction, it can sound like a... Uh, an evaluation of character. If you've held a belief for a very long time and you haven't separated the belief from self, questioning that can be tantamount to questioning self. Right. So it's fascinating to me. I mean, it's always fascinating to me when people hold on to beliefs very tightly and refuse to examine them when those beliefs are uh, negatively impacting their life. Right. That's, that's pretty classic psychotherapy, honestly. But what's, what's even more fascinating is something you touched on about what would my mother think? What would my church think? What would my, you know, fill in the blank think? And it's like, well, well, what would those people be doing in your bedroom anyway? (laughs) Well, here's the thing, you know, I had a colleague years ago who wrote a book called The Crowded Bed, which, you know, you don't even have to read the book to know what that's about. It's Uh like, how many people are in your head while you're in bed with your partner having sex? Yeah, that's wild. And don't do that. And that's gross. And you can't do that. And blah, blah, you're going to go to hell. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's crowded. No, it's it's real too, and, it, and those are real fears. They're, they may be irrational, but they're real fears that really right. interfere with lots of things. And I, and to take it out of the realm of sex for a moment, we could look at uh, career choice or choice of college major or uh, ha- hobbies yeah. hobbies uh-huh. that you do, all sorts right. of things. Right, and we're governed suddenly not by ourselves, but by the the voices of authority that raised us and surround That's us, right. that kind of thing. Which speaks to advertising and marketing and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think people really, I really want people to take away and consider, if you're not happy with your sex life, what is your part in it? What are you not bringing? What aren't you talking about? I hear women say sometimes, well, he's not very romantic. And I ask, well, when was the last time you were romantic? What was the last time you did the things that you love doing, whether it's, you know, any number of things, making a, a picnic and bringing champagne or um, you take a bubble bath because it makes you feel sexy. Don't expect that he's going to get in the tub with you. Mm-hmm. Um, where the things that make you feel sexy aroused, bring your best to the experience instead of waiting for your partner to do it to you or for you. I think we're taught that by movies Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yes. there's a lot of mind reading that's expected and, that, uh, right. oh, he, he just showed up with the candy. It's like, you know, kids at Christmas time. Well, parents don't just magically know what their kids want. They pay attention throughout the year and then they buy them the, the thing that they want. And then it's a surprise. And, and they get them to make lists of Santa Claus. They sure do. Now, what right. if we you know, what if we did that with our mates? Here's what I like. Here's what I don't. Well, it takes it takes the romance out. It takes the surprise out. Well, yeah, but you're getting what you want. Well, it can actually be a fun form of novelty if we each make a list of what turns us on sexually because it's too hard to talk about it, like it feels too shameful or embarrassing, so why don't we each make a list and share our lists with each other, and maybe we mail it to each other, or we leave it in a card for each other, that might be safer than mailing, Um, (laughs) so that we read it, it. It's it's like writing a love letter to each other, or something that's kind of pornographic or dirty to each other. That can be titillating and fun, and then each person picks something off that list that they want to do for the other. And that's when it's mutual and um, it's collective. It's about the coupleship, not about one person blaming someone else because they're, you know, frigid or a bore or some other pejorative word. I'm, I'm furiously taking notes, by the way, for those of you who are uh, listening. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, who's got time for that? Uh, <laughs> uh, we we therapists learn from each other. Um, That's true. But I want to go back to the the pornography thing and, and children. And you said something very startling to me, which is that people will you know know everything there is to know about sex by the age of twenty if they're if they dive into that rabbit hole. Um, and I was I was ready to add a, an asterisk onto that, which is except for the actual experience, which includes things like. Um, touch and smells and sounds and that kind of thing. 
and I, and in my experience, when I've worked with, with adolescents who are into pornography and then they struggle with their relationships or young adults who were into it and struggling presently and so forth, it's that they have an unrealistic expectation because uh, film and, and static images will never portray what real life is like, you know, including those conversations right. and that intimacy and whatnot. So help, help us understand how do you combat that once, once you've recognized the problem? And then also how do parents um, shield their children's innocence these, these days and ages? Yeah. So these are really big, big questions. Um, for starters, you know, there, there's information out there that's looking at this pornography situation and saying really the, Right now, the average youngest viewing age is eight years old of internet porn. And wow. I've met clients who started looking at it much younger um, than they saw it for the first time at five. And being a Playboy at five versus digital pornography at five or eight is very different. It is. Uh, because the level of novelty from the digitized images on the brain into the body is intense. Um, you know, when you think about the first time you saw porn, there, if you saw it really young, it was gross. It's as gross as seeing, um, you know, like a dismembered body on the side of the road mm -hmm. because you're looking up a woman's vagina. And so that can be really, really gross, disgusting, activating to a young brain because they don't have a compass for it. There's no place to put it. They have, their hormones haven't even come online yet. And so this image, watching these images over and over again, you know, we know what fires together, wires together in the brain. And so these become tenacious neural networks, and we learn through dopamine-based um, enhancements. So when something's novel, dopamine fires off, and this is highly novel material. And so people start to put together that this is what they're supposed to do. Boys think this is what girls want. Girls think this is what boys want. And so they don't know how to have sex. And we're seeing that teenagers and young people are having less sex than ever before, not more. Um, if you look at the work of Twenji and Campbell from San Diego, um, they're on the forefront of doing this type of research. And a study came out, I think, in 18, um, about this, about how much less sex young people are having. It was also reprinted in the Atlantic Monthly last January, I believe. It's an article worth looking at. Um, so, so much is happening digitally and online and masturbatorily, if that's a word. Sure, it is now. That it would be the sort of normal developmental phase of courtship that you're talking about is getting erased from many people. So, and, and what comes up a lot for young people is that they don't want to feel awkward. They want to feel cool. And so it's awkward to ask someone out. It's awkward to try to have sex with somebody. And these are all the things that are developmental tasks. And there's also a wholesomeness to the awkwardness of fumbling around for the first time and, mm -hmm. you know, feeling a body part that's not yours, whether it's a breast or a penis, like, because you don't have one. Yeah. Um, and it feels simultaneously a little icky and also a little arousing. Um, that whole process is getting leapfrogged uh, by way of porn and digital sex. So, you know, there's a there's a scene in the show Billions. If anybody's a fan of that show, I happened to catch a couple of episodes, and there was one where a lawyer who's divorced is talking to a lawyer who's separated and challenged, and the guy's you know well into his maybe late forties, early fifties, and he's dating these really young women that are in their twenties. Um, and he says to the other lawyer, he says, these young women, you know, grew up on porn, so they'll lick your dirty parts, but they don't really have what our wives, my ex-wife and your wife have. They don't compare at all because they're not women. And so uh. that was such a sort of striking line to me, and it says so much about um, the way we are training ourselves to be sexual super early on now with porn but it doesn't mean we know how to be relational. And I don't know what that's going to hold for us in the future. It's startling. Uh, I know that. I, there's some, by the way, I want to give proper credit because you told me how to pronounce Gene Twenge's name. I thought, I always thought it was Twenge. Um, but it's T-W-E-N-G-E if you, if anybody right. wants to look that up. But um, excellent work. She writes a lot of, uh, on a lot of stuff. So, um 
I've, I've taught uh, emotional functioning for a number of years, and there's an anthropological.